Uh, hi all, I'm Anand Chandrasekharan. Um, I'm the CTO of an uh, artificial intelligence and computer vision company called Mad Street Den. We're based out of Madras, Madras in the Bay Area. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about the company today. I'm, I'm here to talk to you about something that I used to do when I was a postdoc at Stanford. Uh, and, it's, uh, and what I'm hoping to cover over here is a very brief introduction into a field called neuromorphic engineering. And I'll hopefully convince you that it is one of the things that you should be paying attention to and is of relevance to the world. So um, uh, we heard Silesh bring up some very interesting points in the previous session. And uh, some of those had have some very important um, implications to the way we build the architectures of how uh, the intelligence we're delivering to the world comes about. Uh, deep learning, as he pointed out, has some inherent flaws in it. Um, and uh, uh, I tend to agree with him. You don't, want, you don't need to be training things with a million images to actually come up with uh, useful and generalized intelligence. And um, neuromorphic engineering uh, isn't um, directly concerned with that, except that it's in its underpinnings, it draws inspiration from neuroscience where we know that we don't learn that way. We know that as humans, we don't learn by tra training on a million images. So um, hopefully, this, uh, this is a bridge into answering some of his questions, the questions that he raised, and uh, poses extra relevance because of that. OK, so um, about the title of the talk. So that's, that's actually fairly straightforward. Moore's Law, most of you guys are aware of. It, expresses this observation that was made a long time ago that, and I'm paraphrasing here, that compute capability will keep doubling every 18 months or something like that. Interestingly, this, this term, Moore's Law, was coined by a person named Carver Mead, who went on to become the, fa uh, the father of neuromorphic engineering, and his lab in Caltech pretty much spawned every professor out there who does neuromorphic engineering today. And um, so, we are fast approaching certain fundamental limits in physics, and so Moore's law is, is getting harder and harder to maintain. Uh, it's more of a wish. It's something that the world is collectively trying to keep true because we see the benefits of doubling our compute capability. But we're going. To, uh, we've seen the staggering costs that it entail. Uh, that in, uh, that has to be put into building the next level of technology. Every time we try to uh, decrease the process size, you're talking about billions and billions of dollars invested into that, and only companies like Intel and IBM can actually do that. Well, there are alternatives to that. If you think about the goal or the hope behind Moore's Law, which is about doing more with every passing year, then what we need to be doing is looking at alternate architectures, thinking in parallel rather than series, uh, not wor worrying about von Neumann architectures and working on uh, neuromorphic architectures instead, for example. So, um, so I'm going to cover some very basics to make sure we're all ta uh, speaking the same jargon. And, uh, and uh, uh, most of you are familiar with some of these. Uh, since the under underlying principles over here are neuroscience, so I'm just giving you a brief primer, uh, we can very simply think of a neuron in your brain as a fundamental unit of computation. It doesn't have to be. You guys can argue with me about whether that's philosophically true. But for convenience sake, let's just consider the neuron to be a, the uh, fundamental unit of computation that happens in the brain. We have our analogy, and most people in this audience are familiar with these in machine learning. You either call it a neuron, you call it a f convolutional filter, a feature extractor, whatever you call it. It, it shares its basic uh, capabilities. Uh, you have a cell body which has these things called dendrites. The dendrites essentially serve as a filtering mechanism through which you collect inputs from other computing elements. Uh, those things are then pass through some kind of nonlinearity, essentially the same over there, which allows the, the computing element to decide whether to pass on that information or not. And that information is then uh, transmitted through the brain using uh, these long cables, extremely long wires uh, called axons that, uh, that take the signal, which is essentially digital, and pass it along to other compute elements, and the process is repeated. Okay. And, and this shares a perfect analogy with the kind of uh, basic compute elements that we have in machine learning today. Um, on a separate level, 
what do you do with these connections? How are they actually connected? There is an analogy over there as well. Uh, in your brain, this picture over here is um, a, an image where a very tiny subsection of a cross section of your brain has been labeled. So these green little things are individual neurons. And what you see is an, a complex and elaborate pattern where their dendrites have a very particular structure. These are the things that uh, filter the information, which is computed, the nonlinearity sitting somewhere close to the cell body, and then you, you get the output out. Right? Uh, this is a familiar deep convolutional network kind of diagram over here. So you have very sim similar analogies. You can think of the width of your convolutional filter to be the same as your, ac uh, your dendritic arbor or axonal arbor. Okay? So, um, and you even have cells in the brain that are fully connected. So these things match up pretty well. But it's at this point that things start deviating. Because how this information is processed, the architecture that goes to uh, make use of this information deviates very rapidly. And the existing machine learning techniques are pretty much just scratching the surface. In fact, most uh, a deep convolutional network, for example, is a purely feed-forward network. And Neuroscience 101 tells us there's 10 times more feedback in the brain. Uh, so there are lots of deviations. And the, the analogies break down. But we're not here to discuss that, or rather, I'm not here to discuss that. Uh, but what I would like to point out is that uh, whatever is true for what we do with neuroscience will be translatable. We can take what we do over there and apply it over here. And so it will be relevant, uh, regardless of the philosophical underpinnings. Okay? So going into the crux of the matter now, when we're talking about scale of these systems, uh, in your human brain, you have something like 100 billion neurons, give or take a few billion, a billion, I'm sure. Uh, and, uh, and these are connected with around 100 trillion connections. Whether all of these are useful or not, completely different discussion. But that's the order of magnitude over here. And when you talk about the scale over here in state-of-the-art machine learning, uh, that's actually not that easy to answer because it it actually depends on the architecture that's being used. So you have extremes. So at one extreme, you have somebody like Henry Markram in, uh, in Europe, who's, bringing, uh, who's building extremely elaborate models of neurons. So you have like, only 10,000 neurons, but you still use supercomputers to compute that uh, because they're extremely elaborately modeled up to the ion channel levels. And at the other level, you have uh, Google and Baidu and uh, Andrew Ng and everybody competing to build the largest deep learning networks every other year. And uh, regardless of which architecture which uh, you're, you're talking about, you're off by orders of magnitude and scale. You're still talking about extremely small networks. And while uh, Silesh uh, brought up a very important point, saying that the size of the network is not important, not necessarily important, uh, a, lot, a lot does depend on how big a system you can actually build. The number of things that you can do will obviously increase with the number of uh, the size of the networks that you build. Uh, a simple analogy from nature would be, uh, well, we are the higher mammals, so-called higher mammals. We essentially have a much larger brain, much more cortical region, uh, a much larger cortical region that can support much more abstract associations, which is what we would associate with, associate with higher forms of intelligence. So regardless of what you do, regardless of what architecture you're actually building. What we have today is orders of magnitude uh, off from what we have in biology. But this doesn't really convey the picture as much as when you think about it in terms of power. Okay? This runs, every one of your brain runs on 20 watts, or give or take. Right? It's 20 watts. And to simulate anything, even at that lower scale, you're talking about megawatt range in power, right? So this is like a blue gene rack, where, uh, probably an older blue gene, which did a petaflop of uh, computation. You could probably use this to build something that's one hundredth the size of this in terms of computational units. We're, we're still not talking about making them useful. We're just talking about what you can fit in here that would run in relatively the same time scales. And you're talking about six orders of magnitude difference in power. Okay? So if you want to ever build an artificial intelligence, you want to build a brain, you want to put, put it in a robot chassis, you can't, cover, uh, you can't connect it to a hydroelectric dam to power it. You're not going to be, essentially you'll have one robot per earth or something like that, right? So this is completely uh, not scalable. 
And so we need to be learning something from here, something about the architecture, and something about how to build this in an efficient manner to ever bridge the gap in scale. Not talking about capability, not talking about function, just talking about scaling and power. Okay? So, well, how do we do that? And that is the field of neuromorphic engineering. Okay? So, starting the 80s, Carver Mead has essentially been pi pioneering um, a lot of work where instead of simulating the brain, you emulate the brain. Right? So, general purpose computing, uh, von Neumann architecture or GPUs of today, it doesn't matter. They can only simulate the brain. Okay? So even though you have great advances in GPU technology and your clusters are capable of doing a lot more, you're still, so maybe you've reduced the order of magnitude by one, but we were talking about six orders of magnitude difference in power. A GPU cluster may save you maybe one, uh, one order of magnitude savings over here. So you're not going to get there, right? So uh, neuromorphic engineering, on the other hand, is about building custom silicon, taking the architecture from the brain and morphing it onto silicon. Neuromorphic engineering, right? So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you two examples over here of uh, two such systems that have come out in the last decade. Uh, the first one, uh, NeuroGrid, was uh, built in Stanford. Uh, in the lab of a guy named Kwabena Bohen. So I, I was very lucky to be part of the team that built it. A minor part, but a part of the team that built this. So what you're seeing over here is a 16-chip system. You can see the size of it. We're not talking about kilowatts or megawatts, right? So this 16-chip system uh, emulates a million neurons with a, with a billion connections. Uh, yes, I, I know it doesn't match up with the billions and trillions we were talking about, but this is a stepping stone towards it. And uh, each of these chips essentially has transistor logic that allows you to emulate how neurons in the brain function. Okay? So I'm not going to go into great details, but just give you a teaser saying uh, we, can, we can morph the analog properties of neurons in the brain by using subthreshold analog uh, logic. So this is the this is the part of the transistor physics and the IV curves that you guys are talking about, uh, which people usually throw away as leakage current. Okay, so picoamp uh, range currents, which are usually not even well characterized. So this is still a bit of sorry, there's still a bit of an art form, but you can harness those extremely tiny currents which have exponential math. And, and mimic the, uh, the kind of biophysical properties that a neuron have. So what this ends up giving you is extremely low power uh, transistor circuits that can emulate the nonlinearities that are captured by neurons in your brain. Okay? So that's part of it. And then uh, to communicate this information, we use asynchronous digital logic. So as opposed to clocks that power all of your chips today, all your CPUs, there are no clocks on this chip. But, uh, can you think about what would happen to a chip uh, that, that's running s uh, circuitry that's, that uses picoamp currents, and you have this massive chip-wide clock that's going up and down? You'd essentially have a clock. It, it would completely screw up all this. So the, uh, uh, the, the communication infrastructure is using asynchronous digital logic, and that's, that's kind of the, a teaser into the kind of technology that goes into building such a chip. Uh, so this, neur this NeuroGrid chip back in... 2009, 10-ish, was at that time, I believe, the largest neuromorphic system ever built. Uh, several years later, we have this thing called True North, which came out of IBM Almaden. Uh, so they have a group called the Cognitive Computing Group over there. Uh, so um, uh, my fellow postdocs who actually built NeuroGrid are part of uh, that team. And they, they built True North, which is essentially 16 times the size. So here you have uh, each uh, True North chip having a million, transist uh, million neurons, essentially. Uh, some differences in architecture, some differences in technology used. They, they in fact, don't even use the uh, subthreshold analog. The entire chip is uh, digital. But it, it, it's still a path towards building these kind of networks at, and at scale. Right? And IBM is investing in it. Qualcomm is investing in it. There are several other big companies that are investing in it. Because they all see the value of, of these new architectures in actually pushing the envelope on how much compute can actually be done. Okay? So uh, there are a whole bunch of other such uh, neuromorphic systems out there. Uh, I, I obviously, uh, in an introductory talk, we can't go into all of the details and all the flavors and variants there are. But this is an active area of uh, research. 
in most of the rest of the world. And we need to bump it up in India as well. And that's part of my agenda for this talk, is to drive a little bit extra interest into uh, doing some of this ourselves, because this is part of the future that's coming. OK, so, for the, so I've given you a brief introduction on why we need it. Power, there's only one answer, it's power. And uh, about what's out there, using in Eurogrid, True North, the Spinnaker, there are a bunch of systems, that's fine. But I wanted to give you a little teaser into how such architectures are built. So I'm going to walk you through an exercise with some building blocks. There are multiple ways to build neuromorphic systems, but I wanted to walk you through an exercise in building one such uh, system and uh, use that as a template to give you an idea of what, in, what it entails to build this, these kind of systems, right? And what, it, what is different about how they compute information. So um, a reminder, uh, the structure of a neuron, you have your filtering uh, bodies, the, the dendrites, which collect information, um, integrate it in the cell body, the soma, and then transmit that information to other uh, compu uh, compute units, right? So, uh, and this is, again, a picture out of uh, NeuroGrid. What ends up happening is uh, uh, they do the VLSI design that allows you to build the individual components that mimic all of these parts and put it together in like a metapixel and then a, uh, and tile it in huge chips, which can then have a huge number of uh, neurons. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to add one extra element over here. This picture over here is uh, our nanowires. Okay? This comes out of HP labs. They built something they, that they dubbed the memristor. Okay? Uh, the memristor is essentially uh, a, a device that mimics the synaptic connections that you have. When one neuron is connecting with another neuron through these axons, what ends up happening at the very tip, the connections, uh, is a release of chemical neurotransmitters that allows you to transduce that electrical signal. Now, uh, in neuromorphic architecture, you could do that with CMOS. You could actually just make circuits that do this. But those circuits are going to be very expensive and very big if you want to capture, uh, um, capture have a lot of them. Remember that the number of connections, which means the number of synapses, is a thousandfold the number of actual compute units. So we're talking about a lot of lot of connections, and you're trying to fit that into the, the CMOS architecture. So memristors are potentially the way, way of the future. So what these things allow are these nanowire junctions allow uh, synapse like synaptic properties to uh, to be expressed over here. So they are capable of learning meaning weight changes, just like you have in your backprop and machine learning and stuff, those weight changes can be captured by altering the, uh, the electrical signals in the, uh, the, the source and the target side. So these things are capable of learning in a way that's analogous to uh, the brain, which, and similarly machine learning weights. And you can capture a lot of weights by, by tiling arrays of these nanowire devices on top of the chip itself one such arch architecture. So brief architecture, you have your s computational units uh, down here. They, uh, they're the ones that integrate and have the nonlinearity and all that kind of stuff. You have your dendrites, which are the filtering units. The, they are what transduce the signals that are coming in from the inputs and convert that into signals that can then be integrated. And on top of that, you have a fabric of connectivity. Uh, all the connections from all the millions or billions of cells that you have have to somehow interact with this dendritic layer to allow such information transmission. Okay. So how is this information transmitted? So what I explained over here is the integration part, but there's also the transmission part. Right? That's missing over here, and I'd, I'd like to briefly touch upon that. Uh, for several decades now, the entire neuromorphic community has been using something called address event representation. It's not unique to neuromorphic engineering, but it's a very convenient way of actually transmitting data. So uh, this, this pixel over here, this single neuron, essentially has to transmit information. That pixel is tiled in an array of neurons. It's just like any layer of a neural network. You have a whole bunch of neurons. And you want this layer to communicate with another layer. Okay. So the way you do it is you take the address of that pixel. Uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, when a neuron fires, so essentially when you've, you've integrated the information and it, it gives you a 1, essentially, that the address of the cell that gave you that information is translated into, um, into a, a packet that you can transmit to other such chips. So neuromorphic chips 
or systems can communicate by just sending information when something happens. So the event, essentially the firing of a neuron, the address of the neuron that actually fired, address, event, representation, is transmitted to another chip where it's delivered at pretty much the same, uh, well, it can be delivered at the same location or with some logic into a larger arbor. Remember what I said, this is the equivalent of your convolutional uh, filter width, right? This is the region of interest for a cell at that target location. So the effect of one neuron firing is felt by its arbor. If you can just transmit it somewhere to the vicinity of that arbor and have this substrate that can transmit this information to the rest of the machinery, the dendrites, the, uh, the soma, so on and so forth. Okay? So this is the basic building block. This is the, um, this is the higher level, how do chips communicate kind of architecture. Okay? So I, I hope you got a feel for that. Now, diving into that pixel, let's look at what happens into that individual pixel and see how we can actually co combine this information to come up with something. So inside that pixel, you have that cell body, the nonlinearity, for which you put, uh, put a bunch of transistor logic to uh, emulate that. You have your filtering transistors, essentially. They serve as the dendrites, which are collecting information from all the input that are coming through. And then you have the equivalent of the source cells. So these, the, the source cells axonal arbor, where that address event representation, uh, the, uh, the individual event actually arrives. Okay? And similarly, when the cell fires, you just send it out of that soma. So this is kind of like a, a zoom in of that previous slide. Now, now I'm going to bring this together with the membrister logic. How would you put membristors, remember the nanowire synapses, so that you can get high density connectivity along with the neuromorphic architecture like this to actually give you an immensely connected learning system. Okay? So that's what we're going to uh, go over in the next one or two slides. Okay? So you have, um, oops, sorry. You can have this crossbar, this bar essentially, represent one nanowire. So uh, one way to think about it is uh, from your silicon substrate, where you've, you've received your, uh, your address, your address event, you pump it up to the top of the chip and send it down a nanowire. Okay? That's oriented in this particular direction. Similarly, you bubble up a connection from the dendritic connections. These are the guys that are going to collect that information straight to the top of the chip and have nanowires run through that, connected to that. Okay. The crossbar essentially gives you a synaptic connection. Okay. And we're talking about nanometers here. That's, that's kind of what you're trying to buy here. What will end up happening is this is how it will end up looking. So this is what happens with one dendritic crossbar and uh, one dendritic nanowire and one axonal nanowire meeting up over here. You have one connection. But what happened to your neighboring pixel and the neighboring pixel in every direction? it'll end up looking up something like this. Okay? So you have this crossbar array where your, uh, so your, your input cells have their uh, target destination that allows you to bubble that signal up and spread it across a certain distance. Okay? And you have your collecting wires, the dendritic wires in blue, which form a cross grid to start collecting this information from a whole bunch of axons. Now, if you take this at scale, you essentially have a grid of these pixels. And uh, so the particular architecture in which I've, I've laid out these wires is actually called a Likarev, uh, Likarev cross net. Look it up if you're interested. It's pretty cool. Uh, so you have all your, all your connections offset by one, one location. So you notice this particular crossbar doesn't touch this one. So obviously you're not shorting connections here, and so uh, and uh, and and a, and a nanowire from such axonal connections from way down, uh, way below the screen over here, would end up terminating prior to hitting the dendritic crossbar. So you have a grid of these alternating crossbars that don't intersect except at synaptic connections. So you don't short them, essentially. So what this will end up doing is give you that axonal and dendritic arbor structure. So, um, uh, to illustrate that, uh, you, I'm going to point out this one blue wire over here. This blue wire ends up over here. It came out of a dendrite of a particular cell. This obviously intersects the axonal wire over here, but doesn't intersect it over here. 
which means each neighboring pixel is looking at a slightly shifted version of the of the input that's coming into the into the chip and this is essentially non overlapping convolutional filters it, that's the analogy you would uh, draw out of uh, your machine learning kind of studies so the analogy comes back in right when you're trying to build your machine learning systems and you want to port them into architectures that are that can allow them to scale to extremely large size you could reuse this kind of technology to get you that kind of connectivity at that kind of density and uh, and make it extremely useful okay so uh, i'm going to wind up this exercise I, I hope i've given you a feel for the the kind of elements that would go into building this architecture there's no way i can make this exhaustive uh, so i'll leave you with uh, okay so just a little bit more so i'll take out all the confusing extra wires and you can see that the input coming in over here is actually hitting these cross uh, the crossbars that you see over here for for the cells that were envisioned okay and and just to summarize uh, what we are talking about from both sides of the picture right so we have our brain which is extremely small and uses extremely little power we're trying to build brains electronic brains so uh, incidentally this is this slide is out of uh, a darpa synapse project uh, report uh, so uh, th uh, this is the kind of thing that true north and neurograde were supposed to help build uh, so your your brain we're trying to make the equivalent electronic brains okay uh, regardless of the exact architecture uh, you need to be able to connect a lot of information from a lot of chips uh, using uh, long range connections this would be uh, dealt with by things like the address event representation i meant uh, i mentioned earlier uh, in those individual chips you would be building dense grids of neurons so essentially neural network layers would be uh, built into that uh, using extremely little power and having a lot of them per chip for each of those neurons you would uh, uh, for each of the neurons you would end up having a lot of crossbar junctions de de delivered through things like memristor uh, nanowires what does this all give you it gives you the 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 beginnings of an architecture that will take your gpu clusters and shrink them to the size of maybe a single board with a few of these chips okay so the the story for all of you guys is when you are building your deep learning algorithms or hopefully building things that go beyond deep learning algorithms you have the hardware architecture that's coming out from labs around the world and companies such as IBM that will allow you to then translate all of that into single chips or single systems that are orders of magnitude several orders of magnitude smaller use much less power and you don't even have to change your computing paradigm right now these boards could sit in the cloud just as your gpu cluster sit on an aws instance and you could still do the same kind of computation right so uh, with that i'll leave you uh, i'll i'll stop talking and i'll leave it uh, open to questions from you guys Yes, True North is built by Dharmendra Moda's Team. cognitive computing group. Okay, yes. and uh, are these chips also capable of allowing you to train, or they take the pre-built neural network and? Yeah, unfortunately, True North does not have learning on, yeah, that's on board. What I was thinking, they don't yeah. use memristor devices. So the goal for uh, um, uh, the Synapse project was to use learn learning capable devices uh, and, and put them on, on the silicon substrate. Unfortunately. it's it, there are practical difficulties to putting this kind of technology on chips it's not yet a reality yeah. at least it's not a, not yet a reality at scale but it's it'll come so you still train your neural networks on gpu clusters and use uh, the pre built ones right so the i think the philosophic ones, yeah the philosophy for uh, dharmendra's group is to train it on their blue gene computers where they have the exact same architecture mapped out as the true north system so you can do all the training on their blue genes once the learning is done have the deployment done on the true north chip that's uh, i think that's the that's the way they're approaching it for the iteration um i doubt the true north chip is going to be on a mobile 
anytime soon. But having said that, companies like Qualcomm started a neuromorphic group specifically to try and build chips that will eventually go into cell phones. So you can have a cognitive coprocessor potentially that would sit on your, uh, on your phone and do some of the tasks that, uh, uh, that are out of, out of scope, which you'd need a GPU cluster in the cloud for. Uh, hi. Sorry. Uh, yeah. when, you're, when you're talking of um, um, <laughs> nano level, the transistors uh, physics also comes as a limitation, right? Sorry? The physics of transistors. Yes. That will be limitation uh, nano level? Uh, so there, there will always be limitations. But, uh, but the kind of density you can achieve with what already exists, the kind of nano wires that they're using at, in HP labs and other places, is that you can hit the equivalent of 10 part 10 intersections per centimeter squared. So that kind of matches what's in your brain. The connectivity we are talking about using a memristor crossbar uh, array it, with today's technology, if they can scale it, matches your brain. In the brain, it's actually potassium ions which are traveling. Sorry? In the brain and the neurons, it is the potassium ions which travel. Lots of different things are Sodium happening. Ions. But yes, yes, they are biophysical uh, processes that use ion channel uh, kinetics, yes. The limitations of transistor physics in the CMOS uh, uh, fabrication, mm -hmm. are they not affecting? That's how for uh, high speeds uh, optic, uh, optical, uh, semiconductor, optical switching was uh, used okay. beca because of the limitations of the physical. Sh sure, so, so there are two ways to approach this. One, you can push the boundaries of physics by trying to come up with new ways. You can uh, try to do uh, optical switching, for example. But there are, uh, there, there is, an alternate path where you can use existing CMOS technology because both True North and NeuroGrid used existing processes. In fact, both of them were built in IBM uh, uh, foundries, right? Uh, so existing CMOS can get you a, a long distance towards meeting a lot of these requirements without having to actually invent anything new. So it's, it's a very powerful argument that the architecture can trump the limit, uh, limitations of physics, which is the basic premise, right? Uh, there are two ways to keep Moore's law alive. One, you continue hitting the boundaries of physics and push for innovation there, which should happen, of course. But you can augment that by exploring alternate uh, architectures that can actually um, uh, give you that boost because of the way they compute as opposed to uh, how many computing elements there are, such that the compute throughput is much higher. Yeah. Uh, hi. So I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, one of them is, uh, what kind of neurons are these systems able to uh, able to you know implement? So are they like are they limited to uh, say integrate and fire neurons, or, or do they go up all the all the way up to you know? Right. So uh, that's uh, there's a very straightforward answer right there in the, my slides. Neurogrid, for example, modeled ion channel kinetics uh, in in a, using subthreshold analog neurons. Okay. Uh, True North, for example, uh, is probably more uh, much closer to integrate and fire neurons because it is all digital. So it, it doesn't have to be one versus the other. Because, uh, and they share the fundamental architecture, which is how you put these systems together. If you, if you believe that there's a lot of power in the exact method of integrating and fire, uh, firing for a, neuron, a neuronal element, you can definitely try different variants. And different people are trying different variants. No. But what is, the, what is actually important is, no, is for example, uh, the richer dynamics that uh, you know other neural models are actually able to accommodate, right? Sure, you could you could try a whole bunch of different models for for, for your basic uh, compute element. Mm -hmm. I, I, there is no limitation. Uh, if the the limitation is to start trying, somebody has to do it, and uh, several people are trying several different neural models. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Hi. Uh, so one thing you told was that you want to motivate people to start doing this in India. Sure. Right. So uh, what's the cost and what's the scale that we are looking at? Sure. Uh, is it really possible to it, do things here? Right. Yeah. Uh, good question. So uh, I was part of an academic lab, right? So uh, in Stanford, NeuroGrid was built in an academic lab. It didn't have to be deep inside IBM with uh, millions of dollars to actually be able to do that. So uh, a NeuroGrid uh, chip. It's still in Stanford. Right, it's, uh, uh, funding is not an issue. Logic there. is, no, 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 let me give you actual numbers, right? So a NeuroGrid chip, uh, we, uh, we built them in batches of 40 or something. Uh, and, um, I'm trying to remember, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, the way it's done is uh, academic labs uh, give, uh, give their um, designs, 
and they're all packaged together so that they share a silicon wafer and before they go to, into like an IBM foundry and, and it's all done, right? So uh, doing a batch of 40 or something like that probably costs $40,000. That's cheap. And with uh, and a NeuroGrid system, if you wanted to build it from scratch, at, when you're not doing it to scale, probably will cost you $40,000. But you're talking about a pocket-sized supercomputer for $40,000. And if done at scale, okay, the, the cost will ob obviously plummet. Because once you can buy the entire wafer and you're doing millions and billions of these chips or something like that, then the, the actual unit cost will drop down. So this is within the realm of possibility today. Yeah? So a single chip uh, could be the same uh, pr uh, price as a Pentium, which I think brings it within the realm of reality. Hey, Anand. Um, so one analogy that's often drawn is uh, between the brain and AI approach and the f uh, airline and bird, uh, the, the flying between the airline, uh, how an aeroplane flies and sure. how a bird flies sure. is often compared with how uh, a brain thinks and how a computer should think. Sure. I'd, li I'd like to know what you think of this comparison, uh, if you're sympathetic, sympathetic to it, and what the community has seen to convince itself that the analogy does not hold in this case. Sure. Um, in, in that it can guarantee success in the longer run. Right. No, I, um, I'm, uh, I'm not trying to punt <laughs> the question, but uh, I don't think it needs an answer. Because uh, let's just take uh, uh, something that Silesh had brought up and I kind of believe in. So deep learning today is draws some analogy from a lot of neuroscience. Definitely, uh, but it has its limitations because it's not uh, adhering to uh, some of the other principles which we think are important. Okay. But are they useful? Yes, absolutely. Otherwise, you won't have this deep learning craze in the world today. So at every point in time, there, there are going to be abstractions which are going to throw out a lot of the, uh, the way it's actually done uh, to build something intermediate which will be very useful. So I see nothing wrong in that. The only problem is we shouldn't go into this whole, uh, you know, like AI and neural networks dying every 10 years or 20 years because the public gets disillusioned. Uh, it doesn't have to happen that way, uh, as, long as, the, as long as people understand and keep moving on it. So uh, hopefully people like myself and other people will continue evolving and building new architectures, uh, going beyond deep learning, uh, while the world exploits deep learning including ourselves, we will exploit deep learning to build useful products. I, I don't see a reason for uh, uh, the world to stick to one versus the other. You'll, you'll always derive some benefit at, at every level of abstraction. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, will superconductors make any difference to this? I know that superconductors field is pretty nascent. It's still yet to evolve a lot, but will it make a big difference to this? Sure. Uh, I, I see no reason why any advance is not going to help over here. I mean, uh, when Carver, Mead and all were starting with these things, nanowire membristors did not exist. So uh, any, any new technology, once it reaches a certain state of maturity, the world will find a way to morph it into this kind of use case. So mm -hmm. uh, th there is no straight answer until okay. it actually is practical to actually morph it. Right. Yeah. And the second question was, uh, we tend to kind of have different abstractions, like uh, let's say I'm talking of a dog. Uh, a dog. Okay. Depending on the context, if I'm talking of a dog and cat, I would uh, treat every dog the same on the, uh, when I'm think uh, talking of in relationship uh, with respect to something else. But when I'm talking of breeds, there's a hierarchy. I'm no longer looking at only at a dog. I'm thinking of Labradors and Poodles all within the dogs. So, uh, and then there is a different abstraction of males and females, so which applies to different species and breeds. And then it applies also to a Labrador, also to a Poodle. Sure. So there is some sort of cross connection between these hierarchies uh, in the way we store the knowledge. S uh, uh, would it be possible to emulate those hierarchies here? Uh, uh, sure. Uh, so um, 
Um, let me paraphrase your question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, so it seems to me that you're asking me whether uh, what we do in our brain, which is having a whole bunch of cross associations, uh, yeah. uh, can be ported to something like this. The answer definitely is yes. Okay. Uh, the reason for building things like this is that you could build larger systems and um, and be able to model such phenomenon. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, the advantage of uh, these guys is that they're not sticking to like a deep learning architecture necessarily, where uh, you can't necessarily combine information across different networks or uh, provide feedback in a way that works very well yet. Uh, these on day one are being built with applications like that in mind. So okay. um, w without going into further detail, I'd, I'd recommend that you go maybe check out what uh, Quabina's lab is now doing with NeuroGrid uh, okay. in terms of uh, applications such as those things. Right. Thank you. I would just like to mention that in IIC, there was, a, uh, there was an experiment. It was reported in Hindu, I think. They s mentioned that they were using, they used some uh, portion of rats' brain cells. Okay. And they connected visual inputs, and they connected the outputs to a uh, to a uh, robotic motors, sure. and they were able to make the robo move around in the room. Sure. I think that they called it wetware. Sure. Uh, because it contains the biological uh, processing units and the the electronic hardware. Uh, I uh, yes. Uh, to mention it. it's if, not a question. If, if you're anything. suggesting that we use wetware instead of uh, no, hardware, no, I'm not suggesting anything. Uh, Just wanted to mention this. No, no, no. And, and and it's definitely possible. The the problem is maintaining organic systems. Uh, you know, the reliability of keeping them alive. Essentially, it's, it's tricky. Yeah. Sure, no, but, but still, if you're talking about cultivating cells, in, uh, having cells in culture and connecting them to networks, uh, w one day, uh, you know, a virus infects your co colony, you're, you've lost your chip, your wetware, right? Uh, these are, by very definition, uh, you, can, you can duplicate this, clone these, make millions and billions of these chips without ever having to worry about things like that, uh, about losing an entire uh, system, yeah. Uh, the other benefit. Uh, so th th there is one additional thing. Wetware, by very definition, you're talking about it having synapses and connections which you can't necessarily measure or capture. Right? The same th reason. Can you read your brain? It, it, the answer is not yet, definitely. And it's not an easy task to do. Because how are you going to actually map out those 10 nanometer or uh, extremely tiny synapses, trillions of them, and actually be able to copy and paste them somewhere and clone it? Well, these, these can be done. Right, because everything over here can be read. Uh, not entirely sure if a memristor array can be read, but potentially. Sorry. <laughs>